All right. It is so great to be here. I have met so many wonderful people, and I bet a lot of you have too. So I am here to pull back the curtain and reveal the secrets of game thinking. And it turns out that has a lot to do with Lean Startup. So I'm going to show you today how to skyrocket your early product design efforts and supercharge your MVP process using game thinking. I'm Amy Jo Kim. I'm a social game designer, an entrepreneur, and a startup coach. Early product design is my specialty. I've helped dozens of teams bring their products to life. So what about you? What brought you here today? Do you ever feel like you really want to accelerate your early design and development process? Do you sometimes find it tough to find exactly the right early customers to test your rough ideas quickly and effectively? Is it tough to take that engaging vision that you have and turn it into a simple, stripped down MVP? I know I have struggled with these issues pretty much on every project I worked on. So today, I'm going to share with you actionable techniques for building a better product in less time using game thinking. First, I want to tell you a story, a very personal story about my journey. And I think you might find something to relate to in your own journey. So when I was a kid, I just loved to play music. We would drive in the car, and I would hear Beatles songs. And I would go home and pick them out on the piano. So my parents got me lessons, because I was into it. And then one day, my teacher said, you're really good. You should go compete in the regionals. And I did. And I hated it. It destroyed my love of music. And I stopped playing for 10 years. It was the thing I loved most. Oh, can you go back, please, the slide? And then years later, after college, I was backpacking through Europe. And I was on a beach in Greece. And there were some Swedish young men who were very cute. And they couldn't speak English. I couldn't speak their language, but one of them had a guitar. So I picked up the guitar. I knew a few chords. And I started playing Beatles songs. And for three hours, we sang around the campfire and communicated beautifully. And that changed my life. Maybe you've had an experience like that, a pivotal moment. So I found another way to play. It wasn't about rank-ordered competition. It was about co-op play. It was about people coming together to do something they couldn't do on their own for a larger purpose. And I've played in bands ever since. I also developed my co-op skills in gaming and in community building, working on amazing products like eBay and The Sims and Ultima Online, building the underlying social systems. Then one day, I got the call. Has anyone here ever heard of Alex Rogopoulos? Well, this gentleman came out to my house in Half Moon Bay on a sunny September day and told me about wanting to build a music game where people playing plastic instruments with no musical talent could feel like they were in a band. Alex Rogopoulos is the CEO of Harmonix, and the game that he told me about became Rock Band. Working on that game from the beginning, I learned what it was like to create an innovative, risky, breakthrough hit with high stakes, with a crack team who really knew what they were doing and were deeply unsure about how to go about it. That experience led me into more breakthrough hits, Covet Fashion, Lumosity, and Happify. How many people have played one of those games? So, all of those taught me about what it's like to work on something when you're not sure of which way to go. And they gave me insights into game thinking, which it turns out at the underlying part of it is all about skill building. So I'm going to give you some actionable strategies and tips. The first one is to design your experience to evolve over time. This requires systems thinking, which is about how something works, not so much about how it looks and feels. So a shortcut that I learned from gaming that I'm going to share with you is to design your end-to-end -end experience with mastery at the end, because that's what you're heading toward. And 
A tactic to do that is to use a framework. There are many good ones. This is the one I like, where you have stages of experience, and then map out at a high level, just sketch out what that experience is over time and how it evolves. The discovery part is for visitors. They want to know, is this right for me? Why would I get value out of this? Onboarding is for newbies. They want to learn the ropes. They want to start getting some real value as soon as they can. Habit building is for regulars. Habit building is not onboarding. Habit building is the day 21 experience, that pleasurable, repeatable activity that pulls you back and gets you better at something that matters to you. Mastery is beyond that. Mastery is for people that have mastered the system, learned the ropes, built up their skills and knowledge, and now they want to play a different kind of game, what we in gaming call the elder game. Let's look at Slack. How many of you use Slack? Awesome, me too. So let's look at the end-to-end -end customer experience in Slack and see what's going on. First of all, how many of you discovered Slack through a friend or colleague? How many of you were assigned to use Slack through your IT department? Exactly. Slack is, happens through social discovery, which is one of the key differentiators between that and other tools. Slack happens when friends and colleagues pull you in to play with them, very similar to the way gaming happens, much more like Minecraft, say, than Yammer. Onboarding. How many of you have ever played a game where you learn the ropes by interacting through a conversation with some sort of bot or character in the game? Well, that's straight out of gaming, and that's what Slack does for onboarding. Slack is a multiplayer tool, but it doesn't throw you into multiplayer. It onboards you in single-player mode using a bot, and that's a much safer way to learn the ropes when you're entering a multiplayer environment as Slack is. Habit building, that's for regulars. That's your day 21, day 30, day 60 experience. Habit building in Slack is fundamentally a multiplayer game. You are engaging through social interactions in a co-op way, cooperative, collaborative with your teams, with your groups. Part of what makes Slack interesting and makes it a skill building environment is the fact that you can customize your experience. It starts with very simple customizations, like customizing your notifications. But you can go on, customize your emojis, and get into bots and integrations, which leads into mastery. In Slack, the fact that it's built as an extensible environment means that mastery is going deeper into customization. You can launch a channel. You can program a bot. You can integrate your app. So Slack evolves, in a sense, to match your skill level, not through the, the old school mechanics, what you see in gamification of points and badges and leaderboards. There's none of that in Slack. Slack evolves through the fundamental system structure of the decisions the team made, which, by the way, came out of years of internal use, which I'll tell you about in a moment. The second strategy from gaming is to find your fun within your core loop first before you move on to all the rest of your design. There's a great book called A Theory of Fun by Raph Koster. How many of you have read that book? Anyway, it's a I have. It's a great book. And he loves to say that fun, he's a very experienced game designer, and he says fun is just another word for learning, and it's really true. Fun means different things to different people. A lot of people that are new to gaming assume gaming is competitive. But that's just part of gaming. And in fact, it's not really the most promising and interesting part for people that are outside of gaming. What is a game? Here's a definition from a textbook from 1995 that's really about artificial conflicts and quantifiable outcomes. And that describes a zero-sum game. This is Game Theory 101. This is important stuff if you want to apply game thinking to your application. A zero-sum game is a game where we are framed as opponents. We are competing over a limited, scarce resource. If I win, you lose. That's a zero-sum game. Every head-to-head -head battle, every rank order competition or leaderboard, every war simulation, polo, chess, and most gambling games are zero-sum games. They're wonderful. Zero-sum games have been popular throughout humanity. But there's a whole other kind of game. I worked on The Sims, and that definition doesn't work for The Sims. 
It has none of those things. And yet, it's the most popular PC selling franchise of all time. So what am, this was the definition I came up with when I was working on that. And that's much closer to a non-zero sum game. This is a game where instead of being framed as opponents, we are partners. We win together, we lose together. So girls playing double dutch on the schoolyard are playing a non, or hopscotch, they're playing a non-zero sum game. Teams in Pictionary, the teams together have to work together. Any team sport is both non-zero sum and zero sum. It's part of what makes it so rich and interesting. The way martial arts is practiced here in the States, very much non-zero sum, everybody wins together. A charity walk or a Kickstarter campaign is a great example of a non-zero sum game because the more people play, the better the outcome. You all win together. It's the opposite in a zero sum game. So it's really important when you're thinking about applying game ideas to what you're doing, ask yourself, what kind of fun are my customers looking for? That's the core of it. Do they want to be partners together? Do they want to win together? Or do they want to be opponents juiced by the excitement of competition? Now, game designers think about this in the context of a core loop. As Dan Cook says, in a loop, you're updating a skill, updating your mental model. That's the thing that leads to player delight. It's not points and badges. So if you have the idea that you want to apply a loop to your, to your product, and you've heard about The Habit Loop or Hooked by Nirial, those books, they're really presenting this awesome loop called an operant conditioning loop or a Skinner box that's very well established and it can actually shape behavior, it's true. But it'll never lead you to player delight and it absolutely won't drive long-term engagement. For that, what you need is skill building. You need to make your customers more awesome, better than they were before. That's the thing that actually hooks people about games. So a core loop is a skill building habit loop. And what happens in really breakthrough games, I told you before I learned about Rock Band, and this is what I saw. For six months, all we did was tune and test our core loop, which is a song. And that's how we found the fun. This is what the Rock Band core loop looks like. And it wasn't until it was really rocking and felt right that we moved on to all the fun stuff that all of you know and love. Tuning that core loop, Finding the kind of fun that your super fans want to have is how smart game designers start their process. In a team collaboration tool like Slack, you have to find the fun as well. And it turned out that Slack was the internal development tool, for those of you who don't know, for a team building an MMO, a multiplayer co-op game, for three years before they shipped it. That's why it's so good. It was, they, were shipped, they were tuning that core loop for three years. There's an engaging activity in the core loop that's pleasurable and repeatable. That's the core of anything that you're building that's game-like. And then you use feedback and progress to promote learning and mastery. Feedback much more so than progress because you can't really learn a skill without feedback. And then you use investment and triggers to pull people back into your game, particularly the kind of triggers where you get people to check their stats and really care about what's going on with other people. So remember, skill building is about making your customers more awesome, and a core loop is a great way to make your customers more skillful. So if you want to build long-term engagement, it's a really good idea to start with a skill building core loop. Now, the third principle that I learned personally from gaming is to connect early with your super fans. How many of you know who Gabe Newell at Valve is. Valve uh, runs the Steam network and it's pioneering huge changes happening in the games industry with economic models and access. And Gabe Newell knows how important the players are to development. And it took me years to figure that out. So there's a book called Crossing the Chasm by Jeffrey Moore. And he talked about how hard it is to go from serving early adopters to the early majority. This book was based on innovation, innovation diffusion theory 30 years earlier, a data-driven theory saying that when innovations spread through communities, they go through your early adopters and innovators first. And it turns out that if you want to cross that chasm and reach the big audience, you really need to find and delight a few passionate early customers first. I cannot emphasize this enough. 
I learned this in gaming. I have relearned it working with dozens of startups. This is a picture from The Sims. Will Wright, who I worked with on many projects, is brilliant at cultivating a community of super fans. And he's smart enough to know he's not designing the ultimate product for the super fans. He's bringing his vision to life with the super fans. So you want to leverage that relationship. You want to find your passionate early adopters. It's got to be a small, tight group before you move on to the super fans. The more you're innovating, the more important this is. You need to find a very small group to solve a real problem for. That's what Slack did. It came to life as a collaboration tool for a distributed team building this amazing game called Glitch. The game didn't succeed financially, but out of it came this tool that we all know and love. For those of you who are thinking, Slack looks simple, I could do that. It's not as simple as it looked, because a lot of the magic is happening in the systems thinking underneath. So when you're bringing your ideas to life with game thinking, I want you to think about these ideas and then think about the order that they happen. This is the way that game designers bring their ideas to life. You can't do everything at once. Start with your core loop. Don't get distracted by pretty onboarding. That can come later. Work on onboarding later because it's more important. Things will grow along as they come, but you're going to want to co-create your mastery systems with your best players, so you don't do that at once. Now, you, you heard me earlier say, think about the experience over time. Yes, think about, sketch out, imagine how your customer's experience evolves over time, but then when you're building your MVP, and you're testing your ideas, your highest risk ideas, do it in this order and you will get further faster. So how can you benefit from these ideas from game thinking? You can use them to focus and accelerate your design process using that chart I showed you. You can use them to identify and leverage the right early customers, the right super fans. It'll save you huge amounts of time. And you can especially use these ideas to build a stripped down yet compelling MVP with that skill building core loop. And our goal, all of us, is to stop building things people don't need and build the products, services, apps, and games that delight our customers. So if you're interested and you want more of this, I have two programs launching in 2016 an online masterclass, and an MVP Club team program for accelerated learning in building a compelling MVP. Go to gettingtalpha.com to find out more. I'd love to stay in touch and hear what you're struggling with, learn more about your pain points and opportunities. Please get in touch and let me know what's important to you. Thank you so much.